welcome back, it's Tab Sleep Lover, and today we've got an amazing painting to dig into. This is by Peter Bruegel, and this is actually a free article on the website. So if you want to check that out, you can go to the website, scroll down to the blog, and you'll find it in the blog thumbnails there. Just click on that. I'll also have a link in the description below if you want to check that out. But this one is pretty complex painting. Peter Bruegel, I want to keep calling him Peter Paul Rubens, but it's actually Peter Bruegel. He was born before Peter Paul Rubens and probably heavily inspired Peter Paul Rubens. But, but here we see Peter Bruegel, good looking chap, right? Probably got a lot of the ladies back then. And in fact, he actually has a few sons, Peter Bruegel the Younger and Jan Bruegel the Elder. And they're both amazing painters as well. And actually they have very similar artistic styles. Peter Bruegel the Younger is very similar to his father. Jan Bruegel the Elder usually has a little more animals in the landscape. Right here you can see that. Very similar to uh, Franz Snyder. Very good with animals and figures. But those are his sons. If you want to read in the article, there is a long legacy of painters and they all came from this guy. Heavily inspired a lot of painters in his lifetime. Uh, Peter Paul Rubens was one of them. Peter Paul Rubens was born after this guy. So probably definitely heavily inspired that master as well. But you can see by his appearance, he looks kind of like scruffy. And a lot of people thought he came from a peasant background because he painted them so much. And we can see in his paintings, he's got a lot of little details, tons and tons of details, but a lot of peasants within the composition there. And he's also got a very great sense of humor. You can see just some of the quirky, just characters that he's developed. This guy's shearing the lamb. This guy's got his head against the wall, I'm not sure why. Just really, really funny. Kind of reminds me of like a Where's Waldo from back in the day, but like Where's Waldo's not even half as good as this, but you can see the similarity is just so complex. Not to compare a comic to a master painting, but you do see some similarities here. And the sense of humor he's got, just, I don't know what this, this, I don't know. Are they shaving this guy or are they threatening him? Who knows? And then we've got this guy down here, guy with antlers. Not sure what's going on, but if you get a chance, just grab one of his high resolution paintings and take a look at all the little characters. You can see he's got a great sense of humor. You can see all these little pigs here. This guy's bending over. I don't know what the hell. No idea what's going on. This guy's feeding the pigs. But yeah, very entertaining to look at. So yeah, he's known for these detailed paintings. Look, how, look at the depth in this one. Just starts in the foreground. You can see he's leading our eyes all the way back to this ship right here. Little rowboat looking thing, sailboat. Pretty cool though, this guy's burning some firewood. Very, very interesting. Yeah, take a look at his stuff. There's another one of his paintings. You can see the complexity. But when it boils all down to the composition, you'll see his design techniques later, how he organizes this complexity in a simple way. Interesting character up here. Yeah, this super fun paintings to look at. This guy's on stilts. They're riding a barrel. Probably a lot of this stuff happened back in those days. There wasn't TikTok or virtual reality, anything like that. You can see this is an ellipse right here, going around in a circle. But we'll keep moving on. Here's some of his etchings. He did a lot of etchings as well, and they're super complex. And then here's one of his drawings. But yeah, was he a peasant? No one could really tell, but he was very sophisticated, and you can see it in his compositions. Here's the original as well, and then you can see some details. Like if you zoom up, to this person. This is a group of women just chilling. It looks like they're eating cereal. It looks like a bowl of milk. It's a wheat field, so maybe some fresh wheat puffs in the cereal. Who knows? And then maybe some wheat bread here. He's he's carving up the, or she. We have to assume with the law of similarity, it's a gestalt psychology principle, we have to assume that all these are women because they're in a group and they're in close proximity to each other. So we'll have to assume they're all similar. And so this must be an older woman even though it looks kind of like a guy. We'll assume she's a woman. And all women chilling in the shade of the tree. And we can see the close-up detail. And the woman is cutting what looks to be bread or something. And then this person in the, the distance as well. And then these two guys are carrying bushels of wheat. Very interesting details. And then we have this guy right here. We saw him under the tree with the women. And we'll call him Willie. And I made up a little story Maybe he had a little bit too much absinthe to drink. He passed out under the shade and everybody else doesn't seem to care. 
because maybe they're used to his antics. Maybe they're used to him being drunk all the time. But uh, thankfully, this little pin here didn't bust open and <laughs> expose his his uh, lower side to the women. Thankfully, he's just he's fine by himself under the tree, passed out, and that's where they're leaving him. So, pretty funny story. That's just Bruegel's sense of humor right here, just showing this guy as a main subject, passed out. So we'll get into the composition and the design techniques. But first off, we find the ratio of the grid, and how we do that is we just get the dimensions of the image, divide those into each other, and we get the ratio. And then if you have the dynamic symmetry book, if not, there's a ratio guide in the back of it. I've organized all the ratios and given examples of which grid might fit that ratio. So it gives us several different options. And this is 1.36, which is very close to the 1.333, which is a four third rectangle. What we do is we test the grids. It lists multiple grids we could try. We'll test those but the important thing is to look for the diagonals and how things are aligning to the grid so here we have the four-third grid aligned to the composition and we can already see specific things lining up but we want to look for diagonals paralleling diagonals and then we also see verticals and horizontals as well but you can see this horizontal is definitely locking into the distant horizon there this one is to the tree and you see this guy's locking in here to the vertical and the horizontal and let's see diagonals and we want to look for diagonals as well that's the key to this grid working well and working the best is things aligned to it and then the diagonals are exact to the painting. So right here, we see this diagonal here locking into the, the wheat field. Same with right here, it's locking in. And then if we look at this side of Willy, we'll see it's paralleling this same exact diagonal. So that's cluing us in that this is the appropriate grid to use. And then we can refine it later, which means we can add more smaller grids inside the mother and learn how Bruegel organized the composition and the smaller details. So look at this lady, she's specifically bending over to pick up the wheat and that's the same exact diagonal of her back and it's locking into the grid. So that's a very good clue that we're on the right track of discovering what this master used. So let's go into, this is the MAD, the major area divisions, which is basically just four smaller grids inside the mother. So here's the mother, and then we've got four smaller grids inside. Then we start to look at what else might be locking in. Look at this guy's arm, the scythe, I think that's what it's called. The handle there is paralleling there, almost locking in, and then his arm coming down here, locking into that diagonal. This guy's shoulder and arm, that specific vertical is locking in. This is going straight down the center of that wheat and right on that vertical, and that's the center of the composition as well. And then you just keep looking at the details. It's so right here, the hat's locking in there, this shoulder and arm going straight down that vertical. This person in the background. So right here on this vertical, this is called a coincidence. This guy's aligned with this guy on the same vertical movement. And we'll get into those here in a second bit, but let's keep looking to what else locks in. It takes a lot of time to just look deeply into a painting. And I know not everybody has this time to do it, so that's why I'm doing it for you. And this paralleling here, this diagonal. And then down here, let's see what else is locking in. This woman's arm, the diagonal of her arms locking in there on that diagonal. So this isn't happenstance, this is actually the master planning it. And we'll refine the grid even more because we've got a lot of open space here with no lines. So easier to organize when you have more lines so you don't have to kind of approximate. Here's a horizontal locking into that horizontal here. This wheat right here locking in specifically right there and here. The edge of her dress right here locking in on that vertical. Her elbow locking on the diagonal. Side of her head locking in on the vertical. Now let's add, this is the refined grid. It's basically 4, 8, 12, 16 in the mother. 16 grids inside the mother. And we'll see all the additional lines we have to organize the composition. Bruegel's using it just like every other master. You can see this is locking in on the horizontal there. Right here, the bowl is locking in on that diagonal. Also this horizontal, the bowl, right there. Her arms locking in on this diagonal. This woman's face locking in on the horizontal, the vertical, the eyes on the diagonal, the hands on that diagonal, this hands on that diagonal, 
So all this, if you're really skeptical, you might think, oh, well, it's just lining up because it's lining up, there's so many lines. But you wanna specifically look at diagonals and the way it's aligning. Like this diagonal of her shirt, zoom up and you'll see it's exactly the same exact diagonal. So once you see this in multiple master paintings, you start to think like, dang, these guys are all doing the same thing. And we were only taught the rule of thirds. So look at this bread right here. Same exact diagonal as this. So very, 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 very cool stuff once you start digging into it yourself. Right here is the cuff of his shirt locking in there. This is the same exact line of it, the collar of his shirt locking in on that horizontal. See the shadow area of this wheat compared to the light area of the wheat? It's on that specific diagonal. So all these diagonals adding up really, really. Here's this one looking, locking in on that diagonal and this diagonal. And his hand is ending right on that eye right there. All these intersection points. So very, very awesome complex composition being organized by this grid system. So here we'll see all the areas locking in there. Really cool. A lot of areas. So let's move on to the gamut. Gamut is derived from, these are four specific diagonals derived from this four third grid. So they're all pulled from the Baroque diagonal, the sinister diagonal, and then the reciprocal diagonals. So you can have more diagonals than four, but I usually just cover the four that are specifically from the, the grid. So usually you can have four, six, eight, doesn't matter, but the more you limit your diagonals, the more you're able to repeat it within the background and hide them and create a hidden rhythm. So that's what Bruegel's doing here. All these diagonals are from the grid and they're repeated within the composition to create a hidden rhythm. And usually this will provoke emotion in the viewer. They will never be able to identify what's going on in the composition, but they'll be able to feel it. And usually when you see a nice composition, something's going on underneath the surface. Right here we have all the coincidences. Some of these are promoted by the grid, that's why we use the grid. The grid promotes gamut as well as coincidences and 90 degree angles, which we'll cover soon, but you'll see how he's organizing this. If you look closer at the details, he's got the edge of this bottle right here, whatever that is, it's aligning to this bird. So say you're designing this composition yourself. Hmm, how do I organize the birds to create more unity and movement? So you use coincidences or you can use other techniques like arabesque, which we'll cover, but right here he's aligning them on the same linear movement. Same with this person, with this person, and then right here, and then the leg. They're all unified on that linear movement. This one, the tree, see this guy's aligned here. You follow it all the way up, and it's aligning to the edge of that tree there. Same with this, the tree's got a nice little wobble in it, but he's coinciding it on that movement as well as Willie's head and shoulder. Same with this one. The tree in the background comes down, meets this person's backside, and then as well as this woman's dress right here. And then this tree with the middle of this wheat stack. So that's the vertical ones. You can also do the horizontal. You can do diagonal as well. I just don't cover that. They're a little harder to find. But you can see the horizontal coincidences running across here, meeting all these areas of interest. Pretty cool. This person's head coming across to the, the wheat laying down this, this person here, and then it comes across to the bottom of this. Uh, it looks like a cart. Same with this lady. Remember, she was bending over to get the wheat. So you follow it across. It meets this guy, meets this wheat stack, and then you go all the way across and it meets this person's head right here. So you can follow those. Go to the site, check that out, follow those. And I know all this seems kind of complex, but if you're looking to do this with your own art and it's a little bit difficult to piece together in your mind, that's why I created the drawing course. You create this cute little snail, but underneath the surface, you're learning how to organize the composition with all of these techniques. If you choose the polar point in the upper right area of that grid, that can be the center of our flower because we want it kind of aligning with this upper ellipse. So we want the petals aligning with this upper ellipse. So I just chose an eye, an intersection point to make the center of the flower. It's not scientific. You just need to choose a spot and align it to other design techniques to create the rhythm and the movement that you want. So there's nothing predetermined or anything like that. It's just logically thinking, where is this contrast? Where is the movement going? All that stuff. So we've got the arabesque going, starting from here, going around that second medium-sized flower, following the ellipse, going down the log, meeting up with the snail body, going around through the log. So that means we can create leaves there to help 
kind of create that dot to dot effect. Meeting the ground plane and then circling around that smaller circle inside. But it's got stuff in there for beginners and advanced artists, so check that out when you can. Definitely designed to help you create compositions like Bruegel did here. So here we have the 90 degree angles, and these are hidden as well. All the design techniques should be hidden, and that way they hit the viewer kind of like a magic trick. They don't really understand what's going on, but they can feel it. They know something special is going on. If you look closer, you'll see this line in the wheat comes down, and it meets that shadow we were talking about, the shadow of the wheat to the light of the wheat. Here's a larger one created from, let's see, I'm gonna turn the original back on. So we'll, we have this little the pitchfork right here coming up, meeting the tree. So that's coinciding and creating a 90 degree angle within the composition, and it's a large one, and it's meeting this diagonal in the background, this shadow area of the trees. You can see it when I turn it on and off, you'll see it hidden in there. So they're a very cool way to hide your design techniques but you can see this one's definitely in there. These, when they're on a tilt, they add a sense of strength to the composition. So here's some triangular enclosures, and these are adhering to the same kind of technique as the 90 degree angles. We're using coincidences to create a shape. And these basic geometric shapes, like the circle, square, triangle, those are easy to create shapes with and easy for the mind to identify. But to turn this on and off, we can see them all hidden within the composition there. You can use subtle changes in contrast, like right here. It's just very subtle change in contrast that can be used to create these enclosures. Or it could be a harsh transition like this. This is a hard edge, this is a soft edge. You can use either one, or really super subtle transitions of contrast like right here. This is very soft edge can't really tell what's going on because of the low contrast and then this is a hard edge but you can see it's all tying together to create that triangular enclosure same with ellipses ellipses are enclosures as well but they function differently they create unity and movement see the movement circling around and turn that on and off you can see it hidden in there and the more you analyze these paintings the more you'll start to be sensitive towards these techniques and you can start to identify them and then incorporate it into your own art. There's a lot of them there. And these tie into the arabesques right here. A lot of the times the masters will overlap these composition techniques and they'll complement each other. You can see that there. Arabesques create the same kind of thing. It's a unity and movement on a elegant type of sweeping motion through the composition. Definitely one of the techniques you can use to provoke emotion in the viewer. Very, very nice technique to use. Gazing direction, this has to do with the balance of the composition. So if you find the bulk of the composition, meaning the area with the most contrast and interest, so basically right here in between these vertical lines is the bulk of the composition because this is mostly negative space on the left here and then this is mostly same kind of negative space nothing really interesting on this side either so you could snip this off snip this off and nothing's missed so Bruegel is creating more negative space on this side so that gives us a balance going from right to left that's the gazing direction of the composition and then sometimes when you flip the image you'll notice a different movement in the composition and this has to do with the way we read from left to right and then also the contrast and then the diagonals within the composition. So when we flip this, we do get a little bit more movement because we have more contrast on the left side here, and then our eyes are reading from left to right, so we're going high contrast, and then it's following down this diagonal and this arabesque right here. So our eyes start here, and then lead down here. In the original, they're kind of pulled in this direction, and nothing's pulling us in this area. There's not really an interesting point to pull our eyes back into this area, so our eyes kind of remain on this right side. It's fine. It's still a great painting, but we can see the difference, and it's something to consider when you're planning your composition, is where the contrast is, where the diagonals, the major diagonals are, and the way we read from left to right. The breathing room, that's the top to bottom balance, and we see he's got more negative space on the top, so that gives us a bottom to top balance. This is basically the bulk of the composition there, going vertically. So we've got sufficient balance in the composition. He's got aerial perspective. He's, you can see he's reduced the contrast here to create more depth. You can create aerial perspective by reducing the contrast like this, like we see in nature, or you can do it with lighting techniques. So like uh, right, maybe right around here, you can tell it's all shaded. See the shadows coming in? And then he's reduced the contrast so much we lose detail in this area. That creates depth. So that's what he's doing here is creating depth. Lose that contrast. FGR, figure ground relationship is super important. I would say if you have one technique you must pay attention to, it's figure-ground relationship. 
And of all the characters within the painting, Willie right here, he sticks out the most. He's got, he's really defined, but he has also got that aspect of view, which is the spread limbs, which helps us identify him. Even if he's a silhouetted shape, we can tell what's going on there. This guy right here, he's got an aspect of view, spread limbs right there. And these guys say they were silhouetted, they would be hard to identify because they're, they don't have that aspect of view. But most of them do have nice figure ground relationship. And then when you're looking at your composition, make sure you squint. This will help you simplify the scene. And then you can kind of identify where the contrast is. You see a lot of the contrast is in the sky that's obvious but usually the sky or like uh, street lights uh, lamps in the rooms those will have a lot of contrast but we obviously know that those aren't the main subject so we're kind of uh, drawn to this area here and we'll find out why in a second but yeah blur your vision it's going to simplify the scene and you'll be able to see if you've got sufficient contrast in the important areas also run your eyes around the edge Make sure there's no high contrast around the edges. I noticed this one area it was kind of curious and I looked closer at it. I was like, why did he add that down there? And what is that? What's going on down there? It looks like it's just a place where they might put wheat or something like that, but you can see his, his name in there. And you'll notice his sons have an H in their name. Bruegel right here, there's no H where he signed it. And that's because he dropped the H later because his sons got so good that they were copying his work and it was hard to tell the difference between them. So he removed the H from his name so they could tell. If everybody signs Bruegel, you can't really tell if they have the same artistic style. So after Edge Flicker, we've got the greatest area of contrast. And the reason our eyes were drawn to that area right here is because has this very light area from the wheat against this dark area of the trees. So that's drawing a lot of attention. But if you cover up your hand on that area, it'll bring attention back to these characters down here. But what I think is going on is this is drawing a lot of attention, but he's got that tree to lead our eyes down to this group. So he's basically showing us a landscape. It's a landscape full of the wheat field and the distant ocean and the tree. But then he does a great job of his composition techniques and it leads us down to this group right down here. And then we start to explore the smaller details. So you could reduce this area of contrast, probably make that darker. Like maybe Maybe he could have used this darker wheat color up here and it would have drawn less attention. Maybe fade that a little bit and draw less attention to that area. So that's how you can control the, the contrast a little bit more. Just reduce it and then bring more attention back here. But great painting overall, great composition, but he's using the same exact design techniques as other masters and the same exact design techniques that we can use in our art. So if you get a chance, check out the article. There's a lot of free articles within the newsletter and then the drawing course is there if you want to learn more. But until next time, I will talk to you later. Thanks so much for all the support. Take care.